Good morning, students. Good morning. Today we are having lecture number five in microbiology. Firstly, I want uh, to say that today we will discuss uh, two lectures, lecture number five and the next one lecture number six. Lecture number six is about immunity. This lecture is uh, not large and for your practical classes, for your practical classes next week, you must prepare, you must learn both number five and number six. So you must learn everything that I explain today. Every group must learn everything, both lectures number five and number six that I explain today. Uh, firstly, in lecture number five, in the first part, we are going to talk about microflora of air, water and soil. Then we will discuss the human microflora and we will talk about such condition of human organism as dysbacteriosis. Uh, previous lectures previous lectures we uh, talked about morphology of microorganisms, about their metabolism, about genetic of microorganisms and about infections and uh, antibiotics uh, used for treatment of these infections. Today, today we should talk, we should talk about habitation of microorganisms in environment. This lecture number five and number six is the last lecture in a, a general microbiology here. Uh, next lecture um, will start special microbiology. So next class, practical class number five and number six will be combined. And after that, after that, every group will have colloquium colloquium that include that include uh, lectures from number one up to the last one up to number five number six uh, the first question that we discussed today that we discussed today is a sanitary microbiology firstly what is sanitary microbiology uh, we can say that it is a part of medical microbiology, part of microbiology. So, sanitary microbiology is the study of microorganisms, also pathogenic microorganisms, processes caused by them in an environment and their influence at human health. Once more, let's read once more. It is study of microorganisms and processes caused by these microorganisms in environment and then study of influence of this microorganisms at human health. So sanitary microbiology studies microorganisms in air, water and soil. Environment can consist pathogenic microorganisms that cause that cause infections in human pathogenic uh, bacteria or viruses can be present in air water and soil and uh, they can be the causative agents of infections so uh, the role of sanitary microbiology is in warning of infection disease region then in control of water, air, soil, foodstuffs with the purpose of detection of pathogenic microorganisms. So 
sanitary microbiology must control the presence of pathogenic microorganisms in water, especially in drinking water, in air, especially in air hospitals, in soil, especially in soil, uh, in um, around the hospitals, schools or kindergartens. And then sanitary microbiology uh, deals with control of indicator microorganisms, which are the indirect indexes of environmental infection. And the first, the first uh, that we talk about microorganisms uh, is the microflora of water and methods of microbiological research of water. Firstly, we should say that water plays a very important role in transmission of many infectious diseases. For example, cholera is transmitted uh, via fecal oral and uh, Vibrio cholera is a causative agent of cholera, is present in water, in drinking water, and uh, this disease uh, spread in such countries, such Asian countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, in countries uh, which uh, climate is uh, wet, warm, and where uh, people use drinking water from rivers or lakes. Hepatitis A is a viral disease that is also transmitted with water. Bacteria, pathogenic bacteria, are discharged with feces of sick humans and together with sewage, with feces, they enter in the water of rivers or lakes. And then people take water for drinking, for cooking there. So uh, such, such people can be infected, can be infected with these diseases. Indicator, indicator microorganisms, these are bacteria that are used to detect fecal contamination of water. Indicator microorganisms are bacteria that are used to detect fecal contamination of water. These are bacteria that shows that there are feces in drinking water. What are indicator microorganisms? What are these indicator microorganisms uh, for water? Which bacteria shows, which bacteria shows that uh, there are feces in water that this water is not safe. These are coliforms. Coliforms. Coliforms are indicator bacteria for water. What are these? These are gram negative, non sporing, root shaped bacteria that ferment lactose to gas within uh, 48 hours in lactose broth. And uh, for example, these are Escherichia coli, Enterobacter, and Citrobacter. All these bacteria are present, are normally present in human intestine. They are members of a normal microflora. So these bacteria are discharged with feces, human feces, and they can contaminate water in rivers and lakes. When these bacteria enter uh, the human organisms via drinking water, they can cause infections. And uh, biological properties of these bacteria are similar, are similar, I have said about it. That they are gram-negative, they don't produce spores, they are shaped, and they ferment lactose. Coliforms means that they are um, they have similar properties like E. coli, like a main member of this group. Main member is E. coli. So uh, 
other bacteria are also called coliforms. They are similar to E. coli. Which microbiological uh, parameters or characteristics or indexes of safety of water? Which indexes are detected for drinking water, for water that we uh, may drink? The first one is a common microbial number. It is the total number of all bacteria in one milliliter of water. This common microbial number must be no more than 100. In water, uh, there can be a different bacteria. It can be uh, non-pathogenic bacteria, non-pathogenic bacteria that don't cause disease in human. But it can be pathogenic bacteria. In total, in total, uh, it must not be more than 100 bacteria in one milliliter. The another index is a number of coliforms bacteria, number of coliforms. Uh, here we should count amount of E. coli, Enterobacter and Citrobacter, for example, in 1000 milliliter of water or in one liter. In one liter of water, it must no, no more than three bacteria of coliforms. No more than three bacteria of coliforms. Uh, the next criterion, the next criterion is the index of fresh fecal contamination. Fresh fecal contamination is the amount of E. coli. Uh, in one thousand liter, of water it must be absent at all it must be absent at all E. coli uh, are indicators of fresh fecal contamination it means that uh, fresh fecal contamination occurs no uh, during the last uh, four or five months if bacteria are detected in drinking water, it means that feces, feces uh, entered in water uh, during the last four five months. And the last uh, index of safety of water is a quantity of coliphages. I remind you that phages or bacteria phages uh, are viruses that infect uh, E. coli. If E. coli are present in drinking water, bacteriophages are also present there. So if they are detected, if bacteriophages are detected in drinking water, it means that E. coli are present. In 1,000 ml of water, it must be absent. Coliphages must be absent. We have just said about these indexes, but how to uh, count? We know that bacteria are invisible, uh, bacteria can't be seen with an uh, unnaked eye. How to count these indexes? There are uh, two methods for detection, for detection uh, of bacteria in uh, drinking water or methods of microbiological research of water. It means how can we detect, how can we detect bacteria in drinking water. The first method, the first method is fermenting method, fermenting method. Um, its name arises from uh, word fermentation. Fermentation, it is a process of uh, destruction of lactose or any, any other sugar. How is this method done? We should take drinking water uh, in volume 100 milliliter, 10 milliliter, or 1 milliliter. Which um, volume is taken? Um, it depends on the um, size of a river or a lake, or maybe you want to check drinking water uh, in a bottle. That's why if uh, we uh, check drinking water in bottle, you should take one milliliter. If it is river, river, 
or we should take 100 milliliter. Then we inoculate, we inoculate, or we add this water in lactose pipton broth. Lactose pipton broth. It is a nutrient medium that consists of lactose and pipton. And we should uh, incubate in, in thermostat at optimal temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, during 18-24 hours. These conditions are also used for incubation of all bacteria. After one day, after 24 hours, in positive case, in positive case, we can see fermentation. Fermentation that lactose is fermented, lactose is fermented, and uh, uh, we can see that bubbles of gaze are present. We can see fermentation, a result of lactose fermentation uh, that shows the presence of coliforms. What does it mean? We have said that coliforms are gram-negative, bacteria, non-sporing, uh, non non-sporing that are able to ferment lactose into gas. So if there are bubbles of gas, it means the presence of coliforms. Then we should take some material from this tube and re-inoculate on end agar. You remember that end agar is a differential medium for uh, E. coli. This medium becomes pink in the presence of E. coli. As another method is a method of membrane filters. It is called method of membrane filters. Sometimes it is called filtration method, filtration, because we use uh, filters here. We should uh, uh, take uh, about 333 uh, milliliters of drinking water or 110 or one milliliter from uh, the open reservoirs like rivers or lakes. Then we should filtrate this water through a membrane filter and put this filter on end agar. Look here. This is water that is taken from lakes or rivers, drinking water, and we should filtrate it through membrane filters. Bacteria, bacteria are attached to the surface of membrane filters. They are stopped here. So then we should take this filter, membrane filter, with bacteria on it, and put this filter on end agar, end medium, and incubate it during 24 hours at optimal temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. After 24 hours, we can see pink colonies. These are lactose positive, means these are uh, E. coli colonies. Then we should count amount of colonies. Amount of colonies. You know that colony, colony is a result. It is a group of microorganisms that arise from one uh, bacterial cell. Result of multiplication of one bacterial cell. So it means that we can measure, we can count how many uh, bacteria there were in uh, water that we collected. The another that we should discuss it is the microflora of the soil and how to detect, how to research microorganisms of the soil. Uh, soil is a major environment for habitation of microorganisms. If we compare soil and water, we can say that both these environments are favorable for bacteria. Why? Because in both water and uh, um, soil there are nutrients for bacteria. Uh, in soil uh, there is a place for adherence. There are no um, 
dangerous factors for bacteria like ultraviolet light. So, soil and water are favorable uh, habitat, habitats for uh, bacteria. Indicator microorganisms, you remember, I have said that indicator microorganisms are microorganisms that show the contamination of soil. These are coliforms, it's like in water, coliforms are E. coli, Enterobacter and Citrobacter. Then Streptococcus fecalis, it's also the member of uh, intestine microflora and Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens is a spore-forming bacteria, spore-forming bacteria. In intestine, uh, it lives in vegetative form. These are living cells. When Clostridium perfringens uh, is discharged with uh, feces um, outside, in environment, it forms spores and it can be survived during long period, during several years. So, Clostridium perfringens detect old fecal contamination because it, it is present in the form of bacterial spores. Clostridium perfringens um, always produces spores uh, outside of human organism because this is anaerobic bacteria. Anaerobic means they can live just in complete absence of oxygen. In uh, air there is oxygen, so here bacteria produce spores. And uh, if we detect Clostridium perfringens, it uh, shows the old fecal contamination. That uh, means that it is more than six months. Uh, coliforms and Streptococcus fecalis detect fresh fecal con contamination that uh, appear that appear um, at last in last four five months a degree of fecal contamination of soil is determined on presence and quantity or amount of this species of coliforms streptococcus fecalis and clostridium perfringens this soil is considered as a clean and safe if amount of coliforms and streptococcus fecalis is no more than 10 bacterial cells in one gram of soil. Clean soil, clean soil must contain no more than 10 bacterial cells in one gram of soil. Uh, why do we detect, uh, why do we control um, the presence of microorganisms, the presence of pathogenic bacteria in soil. Uh, we should uh, detect, we should control the presence of pathogenic bacteria in soil uh, before building of schools, kindergartens of other uh, main organizations like hospitals. We should detect the presence of pathogenic bacteria uh, in places uh, where children play because they contact with soil and they can be contaminated. That's why we should control, control the uh, bacteriological or microbiological condition of soil. How to do it? Um, there is one method, there is one method, it is very easy. Uh, how can we do, how can we study uh, bacteriological indicators of bacterial indicators micro indicator microorganisms of soil firstly we should take soil samples from three points from the area of uh, 100 square meters and mix it uh, three soil samples then we should prepare some dilutions of soil suspensions. We should uh, take one gram of soil that we collected and uh, uh, mix it with 100 milliliter of sterile water. Sterile water is the water that is lack of any microorganisms. Sterile. So we prepare uh, dilution. We sh shake it in the tube 
and then we inoculate this dilution on solid and liquid nutrient media or culture media for the detection of bacteria. We incubate it at thermostat at optimal temperature 37 degrees Celsius for 18-24 hours and then we should detect indicator microorganisms, coliforms. To detect coliforms we should use and agar. Uh, to detect Streptococcus faecalis and Clostridium perfringens, we can use other medium. Uh, for example, to detect Clostridium perfringens, we should uh, inoculate it and incubate in anaerobic conditions. Then we should talk about microflora of air. Microflora of air. Firstly, air for microorganisms is less favorable environment than soil and water. Why? Because there is a ultraviolet light here that is dangerous for bacteria, that can dry bacteria. Uh, there are no nutrients, there are no any nutrients in uh, air. There is no uh, substrate for adherence in air. There is no any substrate for adherence of bacteria. But many microbes in air can be saved more or less long time. Main source of microbial air pollution is a human. When we cough, when we speak, bacteria are discharged from nose, from mouth, from nasopharynx, and they spread in air. Which characteristics, which indexes are evaluated for detection of microorganisms of air. The first one is a general microbial number. General microbial number of air is the total amount of bacteria in one cubic meter. You understand that for water and for soil, we detect in one milliliter in water and one gram in soil. Here, here in air, we detected in one cubic meter. What are indicator microorganisms? These are Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus hemolyticus. Please don't be confused. A lot of students uh, say that it is E. coli. E. coli is a member of intestine microflora. It can be spread, it can't be spread in air. Human is a main source for microbial contamination of air when we speak, when we cough. That's why indicator microorganisms are discharged from nose and from mouth. What are these? These are microorganisms that live in nose, in mucosal membrane of nose, and in nasopharynx. These are Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus hemolyticus. These microorganisms are detected in air. Why do we detect? Why uh, is it important to detect microorganisms in air? The large value of cleanness of air is in operation rooms, reanimation departments, dressing rooms, maternity halls, and chambers for neonatal. We especially must control the presence of indicator microorganisms in air of hospitals. Total number of microbes in operation hall before the operation should not exceed 500 in one cubic meter and after operation shouldn't exceed 1000 in one cubic meter. Here we are talking about general microbial number. It is a total number. So total number of all microorganisms. It can be non-pathogenic too. It can be non-pathogenic bacteria. So total number no more than 500 before operation and no more than uh, 1000 after operation. But 
if we are talking about indicator microorganisms like Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, its quantity should not be at all in operation halls, in operation departments. Because these microorganisms are the main causative agents of wound infections that occur in patient after surgical operations. Who are the sources of uh, Staphylococcus and Streptococcus at operation halls? These are doctors, doctors and nurses and other medical staff that discharge it during talking, during uh, speaking, coughing, during work, during breathing, during the breath. So you know that all doctors, all sur surgeries uh, works in mask, in mask. How to detect? How to detect bacteria? How to detect total microbial, uh, general microbial number of bacteria uh, in air? There are two methods. Um, the first one is sedimentation method. Sedimentation method. It is very easy method. Air is inoculated on open petri dishes with nutrient agar for 60 minutes. From 30 or 60 minutes. So we should take open petri dish and we should stay open it for one hour. Bacteria are settled on the surface of nutrient medium. Then after one hour we should incubate it in thermostat at optimal temperature 37 degrees Celsius for one two days and after that after that we should count amount of colonies in this petri dish the another one is aspiration method uh, sedimentation method is method of um, passive settling or passive sedimentation bacteria are settled themselves on the surface of nutrient medium while petri dish is opened Aspiration method uh, is uh, using uh, special equipment, Krotov's apparatus. It is used to pass in the special glass above the open petri dish with mid-15 anger. Bacteria are fallen on the medium. So here, here uh, there is a petri dish with nutrient medium. And uh, this uh, nutrient medium, this petri dish is rotating, rotating in uh, Krotov's apparatus. And uh, uh, Krotov's apparatus catch air and bacteria attached to the surface of medium of mid pepton anchor. Then we should also incubate it in the thermostat for 37 degrees Celsius for one or two days. Uh, amount of colonies uh, shows the level of cleanness of air. If amount of colonies after incubation is less or equals to 250 colonies, this air is clean. If amount of colonies is from 250 up to 500 colonies, uh, it's medium contamination degree of air. And if amount of colonies equals or more than 500, this air is muddy. Uh, we have said we have said about microorganisms that live in soil, water, uh, in air. Then we will talk about microorganisms that uh, live in intestine that is normal microflora. But how bacteria, how bacteria live, how bacteria, what is about their uh, association, about their community, what about bacterial community? For example, people, people live in communities. People live as a family, as a groups, for example, when they study, when they work. What about bacteria? Bacteria, bacteria live in human organism, in soil, in water, in form of 
Biofilms. Biofilms. What are these? Microbial biofilms are communities of microorganisms that stick to each other and to surfaces. So the uh, bacteria don't live, uh, um, don't live like one bacteria live here in one organ, another bacteria here. No, they live like communities, and they are very stick to each other. And this uh, is called biofilms. Biofilms are present as a layer, layer on the surface, on the surfaces of mucosal membranes or other objects. How uh, biofilms are formed? Bacteria attach and begin to multiply on the surface, on the surface of mucosal membrane, on the surface of teeth. Then they secrete glycocalyx, glycocalyx, it is slime layers or uh, formed from capsules outside. So the cells bind to the substrate and thicken the biofilm. Biofilm uh, becomes more, uh, becomes bigger and be becomes uh, thicker. You can see here in this diagram, let's look at this diagram. These are colonies, these are bacteria. This is organic surface coating and surface. What is surface? Mucosal membrane of nasopharynx, mucosal membrane of vagina. These are, it can be uh, teeth, it can be uh, some objects, some catheters in human organism. So bacteria are attached to the surface of uh, mucosal membranes. Then cells stick to coating. They produce, let's look here, the third stage. They produce glycocalyx. Glycocalyx, it means they produce some uh, slime substances outside, exopolysaccharide, and they bound each other to each other and to the substrate. And then additional microbes are attracted to the developing of biofilm and they form community, community that is called biofilms. What is the role of biofilms in medicine and what uh, its function? Why do bacteria produce biofilms? Uh, biofilms are very uh, useful, very good for bacteria. They can survive there during long period, but, but for doctors, for doctors, um, it is, uh, we can say that it is dangerous. Why? Biofilms accumulate on damaged tissues such as rheumatic heart wells, heart tissues like teeth, and foreign materials like catheters or artificial hip joints. When we inject, uh, for example, catheter in urinary tract, or when we uh, inject, when we use uh, intravenous catheters, bacteria inhabit the surface of these catheters, cause infection there, and such infections are very difficult for treatment, very difficult for treatment. Infections caused by microbes in biofilms are extremely difficult to treat with antibiotics. Why? Let's uh, look at this diagram once more. We can see that there is a large amount of glycocalyx. Glycocalyx, these are slime, this is slime layer of exopolysaccharide of different substances that are produced outside. Antibiotics and other antimicrobial agents are not able, are not able to pass here, are not able, and they are not able to act to destroy bacteria in this biofilm. 
That's why, that's why it is very difficult to, call, to treat, uh, to fight with bacteria that are present in a form of biofilms. Which bacteria are able to produce biofilms? These are Staphylococcus aureus, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa that cause a lot of hospital infections, Klebsiella pneumonia. These bacteria are able to produce a very large amount of different substances, different uh, glycocalyx, different slime substances outside. Uh, example, uh, another example of uh, biofilm in our organism. Uh, if you uh, haven't cleaned your teeth today, if you haven't uh, cleaned your teeth today, you may feel, you may feel biofilm on your teeth. You may touch your teeth with your tongue touch it and you can feel this layer layer of bacteria on the teeth so it is biofilm biofilm on the teeth biofilm is also produced on the surface of mucosal membrane in vagina for example during the day in this diagram in these diagrams uh, these are micrographs micrographs of scanning microscopy you can see a Staphylococcal biofilm. These are Staphylococcus. This is um, glycocalyx, glycocalyx, external substances. Uh, this is biofilm on the inner surface of an indwelling medical device, maybe a catheter. And these are bacteria. Staphylococcus. You can see that they are joined with other, which some uh, bonds. And this is in this diagram. You can see uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa biofilm in um, catheter, in catheter, on the surface of catheter. We have said about microorganisms that uh, inhabit air, soil. Uh, water, uh, about biofilms, how bacteria are present in um, uh, different places, in different habitats. What about our organism? What about our organism? Our organism, our organism is filled, is filled of large amount of microorganism. We have normal microflora normal microflora or normal flora are microorganisms that are frequently found in various body sites in normal healthy individuals once more from the name of it's you may understand normal microflora these are microorganisms that are normally present normally present in our organism there are two types of normal microflora. Uh, this is resident microflora that includes constant microorganisms uh, that are regularly found in various sites of human body. They are constant present, like E. coli in uh, intestine, like Clostridium perfringens in uh, intestine, too, like Staphylococcus in nasopharynx. Then, Transient microflora are non-constant pathogenic or potentially pathogenic microorganisms that inhabit some sites of human body for hours, days, or weeks. Um, these microflora, these microorganisms are not present constantly. They um, are present occasionally. For example, E. coli lives in intestine, but sometimes uh, um, it can uh, enter the skin after toilet for example it is a uh, not normal um, microflora of skin but it is transient microflora it is occasionally present all human organs all human organs mm, are divided into sterile and non-sterile sterile uh, we talk about sterile water for example in microbiology sterile means are lacked lack lack of any microorganisms so sterile organs are normally free from bacteria 
These organs must not contain any microorganisms. But non-sterile organs are normally inhabited with normal microflora. They have normal or beneficial microorganisms. If we look at this diagram, we can see that uh, different organs are inhabited, inhabited with microorganisms. For example, look here, let's look which organs, which organs are inhabited. Uh, the first one, the first one, uh, let's start from skin. Skin is a non-sterile. Skin is inhabited with Staphylococcus, Corinibacterium, Propionibacterium. Then, hands is also non-sterile because there is a skin here. Vagina in woman. Vagina in woman is a non-sterile. Uh, there is a normal beneficial microflora here, like Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium, Staphylococcus aureus, Candida. And this bacteria form a uh, normal microflora of vagina. Uh, perineum uh, is inhabited by microorganisms too. These are microorganisms as for skin, like Staphylococcus, or, and as for a large intestine, as for a large bowel. Then, sure, it is a digestive system, especially small intestine, small bowel, and large intestine. Small intestine uh, has less amount of microorganisms than large intestine. In small intestine, we can uh, um, find such bacteria as Candida, for example, and uh, up to the up to the large bowel, up to, up to the large bowel. Um, it becomes more inhabited. It consists more of microorganisms. And large bowel consists a great amount of bacteria like Enterobacteriaceae family. Uh, these are E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter proteus, Enterococci, this Enterococcus fecalis, Enterococcus fessum, then Streptococcus, uh, then anaerobic Clostridium, and so other bacteria. Then, what about stomach? What about stomach? How do you think? Is it sterile or non sterile? Uh, normally, stomach is sterile. Why? Why stomach is sterile? Because there is a, uh, acid. There is a acid here, and pH is acidic, and that's why bacteria are killed. But there are some pathogenic microorganisms. Pathogenic is a not normal microflora. Pathogenic that have some uh, adaptations for it. We can we will talk about it later. So stomach doesn't contain uh, any microorganisms. What about respiratory system? Respiratory system. Uh, firstly, about uh, nasopharynx, nose. Uh, then uh, nasopharynx and pharynx. Sure, they are also inhabited by microorganisms like Staphylococcus in nasopharynx. Uh, pharynx is inhabited by uh, Haemophilus, Moraxella, Neisseria, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus. Uh, then uh, trachea. Trachea consists of few microorganisms, few, just few. Bronchus and lungs are sterile, are sterile. Uh, oral cavity is non-sterile, oral cavity is non-sterile, so it consists of uh, viridon streptococci, uh, then some anaerobic gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, candida. Uh, if we are talking about urogenital tract, urogenital tract, uterus, of woman must be sterile, ovaries also must be sterile, uh, but vagin is non-sterile, we have said about it. Uh, in men, penis, uh, the lower part, lower part of uh, urogenital tract is non-sterile, but that uh, contacts, that interacts with air, 
with environment is non-sterile, upper parts of urogenital tract in men must be sterile. Lymph, blood, cerebrospinal fluid must be sterile. Brain, head, kidneys, liver must be sterile. So all, all internal organs, internal organs, especially parenchymatose organs like liver, lungs, kidneys, spleen must be sterile. Organs that interact with uh, uh, environment like skin, organs and sites, skin, uh, oral cavity, um, pharynx, nasopharynx, vagina, uh, intestine, because we eat food. Uh, these organs are non-sterile. What about newborns? What about newborns? At birth, a gastrointestinal path and feces of the child are sterile. But in three, four days after birth, there is an intensive invading them by Escherichia, Proteus, and Staphylococcus. Why? Uh, because of uh, breastfeeding, because of breastfeeding um, of the child uh, by the mother. By the end of the first week, lactate microflora of intestine is uh, formed. They are mainly uh, bifidobacterium and lactobacillus that play a large role in decomposition of memory milk and help uh, the process of digestion. Uh, maybe you know that uh, newborn, newborn are very uh, naughty, are very naughty during the first weeks, the first days and weeks of after the birth. They cry, uh, especially at nights, uh, because of formation of their organs, because of pain in the intestine. Uh, so. Normal microflora of newborn is very, very important. It has a very important role in their digestion. Uh, doctors studied the normal microflora of newborns who is uh, fed by breast milk and who has artificial nutrition, artificial, uh, whose mother can't feed breast milk, for example, because of absence of breast milk. Normal microflora of uh, such children uh, is distinguished. Is distinguished. I mean, children that are fed that are fed uh, up by breast milk and that have uh, and who has uh, artificial nutrition. What are functions of normal microflora of human organism? What are functions? Uh, the first one, it is immune stimulation, immune stimulation. Normal microflora um, are presented with a gram-negative bacteria, for example, E. coli, uh, Proteus, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, and these bacteria are gram-negative. If you remember, gram-negative bacteria produce endotoxin. When this bacteria uh, die, um, they produce endotoxin because of release of endotoxin from cell wall. It is lipopolysaccharide. In small amount, in small amount, when it is produced in small amount, endotoxin can uh, stimulate, can stimulate uh, macrophages for phagocytosis, can stimulate antiviral protein production like interferon. So it is, a, it has a great role of immune stimulation. Uh, the another role is the vitamin synthesis. E. coli, e. coli are able to produce the main vitamins uh, group of uh, B, B and K. Then normal uh, microflora bacteria enhance gut motility, our digestion and nutrient absorption. For example, we don't have uh, some enzymes, some enzymes that destroy some nutrients. Uh, like cellulose. Our organism is not able to produce enzymes for destruction of cellulose, for full destruction. But bacteria are able to do it. Intestine bacteria uh, destroy cellulose 
cellulose in our intestine for uh, finished components, up to finished components. Normal microflora also inhibit pathogenic bacteria via decreasing of pH, uh, decreasing of epithelial binding, and decreasing of epithelial invasion. Um, for example, um, woman's vagina is inhabited by a large amount of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. These are so-called uh, lactic microflora. Bifidobacterium and lactobacillus produce lactic acid. Lactic acid. So, um, pH in vagina, in woman's vagina, is uh, uh, acidic. It is less than um, uh, five. It is about two. Uh, it's about two. Yes. In these conditions, in these conditions, pathogenic, most pathogenic bacteria are not able to live. That's why they are not able to adhere. They are killed by acidic pH. And the last one, normal microflora take part, take part in metabolism of certain drugs, metabolism of certain drugs. But there are some factors, there are some factors that change the normal microflora of the organism. And the, these factors cause such conditions that uh, is called dysbacteriosis. Dysbacteriosis is a change of a quantitative relation and composition of a normal microflora of an organism, mainly of intestine. Once more, it is change of quantitative relation of quantity and composition of normal microflora. It is disturbance of normal microflora. We can call it disturbance of normal microflora. It is decrease or disappearance of some bacteria. Why uh, do dysbacteriosis occur in human? The first one, the first main factor that cause dysbacteriosis are antibiotics. You remember that antibiotics are used for treatment of bacterial infections. That are, these are chemical substances that kill or inhibit growth of bacteria. And you remember that there are broad spectrum and narrow spectrum antibiotics. Broad spectrum antibiotics kill more than one, two species of bacteria. And they kill pathogenic, both pathogenic and normal microflora. After taking of antibiotics, most patients have dysbacteriosis because normal flora bacteria are also killed. Then the next factor is the stress. Because of production, some stress hormones, and the stress hormones inhibit, inhibit growth of normal microflora bacteria. Intestine infections, intestine infections also inhibit normal microflora bacteria because uh, pathogenic bacteria that cause intestine infections produce some toxins, some toxins, enzymes that kill bacteria. Then diet, diet is also uh, harmful for bacteria. And radiation, radiation uh, is harmful for bacteria, it kills bacterial cells. You know that radiation is used for treatment of cancer patients, patients with uh, tumor, uh, and patients with a cancer with tumor has a low, has a weak immunity. Why? It is chain reaction, chain reaction. Look here. When a patient has radiation treatment, radiation treatment, radiation is used to kill uh, tumor cells, tumor cells. So bacterial cells, normal microflora is also killed by this uh, radiation. Uh, let's come back to the functions of normal microflora. If bacterial, if normal microflora is killed, it don't, it doesn't stimulate immune system. That's why, that's why patients after radiation treatment has a weak immunity, weak immunity. How to treat, how to treat this condition? Dysbacteriosis is not disease. 
it is like conditions it is like uh, it is just a result uh, of using of antibiotics and other factors there are some drugs there are some drugs that are used for treatment of dysbacteriosis. Uh, these are three groups, prebiotics, probiotics, and synbiotics. Prebiotics are non-digestible food ingredients that stimulate the growth and activity of bacteria in the colon, in the intestine. Once more, these are food ingredients. They stimulate the growth of bacteria. So what are these ingredients? These are fructooligosaccharide and galactooligosaccharide. You can see, you can see here in this diagram, and fructooligosaccharide and another one, a galactooligosaccharide, uh, may be used, may be used for treatment of dysbacteriosis. When patient uh, start to take uh, starts to take antibiotic, he also must uh, take uh, prebiotics or probiotics or symbiotics. The another one are probiotics. Probiotics are mono or mixed culture of microorganisms. This is culture of microorganisms which apply to men beneficial effects the host by improving the properties of the microflora. Remember that probiotics are cult culture of microorganisms. These are bacteria. These are living bacteria. And for example, uh, these drugs are probiotic lactobacillus, like this one. Look here. So it consists of uh, lactobacillus bacteria in tabulated form or in solid form, like powder, or in liquid form. And V as L number three is a mixture of eight different probiotic strains of bacteria. Once more, prebiotics are food ingredients, probiotics are bacteria, cultural bacteria. And symbiotics is a combination of probiotics and prebiotics, like HLS or um, HCP, like here. It is bacteria lactobacillus in combination with fructooligosaccharide. Sure, symbiotics are the most effective. We have just talked about dysbacteriosis, and now I want to explain you some information about immunity. It is lecture number four. I remind that you must prepare, you must prepare both number five and number uh, number four, number six, sorry, number six, for um, your practical class. Next semester we will study immunology, but we should uh, know some uh, definitions uh, from immunology when we will continue to study microbiology. That's why the first one: what is immunity and what is classification of immunity. Immunity is ability of organism to resist a particular antigens. Immunity is ability to resist a particular antigens to microorganisms or tumors. Immunity is classified into innate and acquired. Innate immunity is present in everyone from the birth. Um, it includes skin as a mechanical barrier tears because it consists of some protective proteins, low pH of stomach that uh, kills bacteria, respiratory cilia, normal flora of gut. Acquired immunity is uh, divided into natural and artificial. Natural, both natural and artificial can be divided into uh, active and passive. Natural active immunity, natural active immunity, develops during exposure to disease and antibodies are produced then. So natural active immunity arise, uh, uh, appears after diseases. And there is immunity after disease, like after mm, uh, whooping cough, after diphtheria. Natural passive immunity, um, it is transmission from mother to child. What is transmitted? 
Antibodies are transmitted from mother to child via breast milk. Active means immune system produces antibodies themselves, itself, like after disease. Passive means immune system uh, doesn't produce antibodies. They are transmitted from mother. Artificial active immunity, artificial. It is artificial way to produce immunity in human organism. Artificial active immunity is produced after vaccination. Vaccination, you know, that vaccine consists of uh, killed or living bacteria or viruses or their particles. Artificial passive immunity, it is injection of antibodies or immunization. Injection of antibodies. Immune system doesn't produce antibodies itself. The in patient uh, gets these antibodies after injection of serum. We have said that immunity is the ability to resist particular antigens. What are antigens? Antigens are foreign micromolecules that, when introduced into the body, cause the formation of the immune response. Antigens are foreign molecules that cause formation of immune response. What are antigens for human organisms? These are native foreign proteins. These are uh, that are present in viruses or bacteria. These are various cellular elements of tissue and organs. Uh, for example, um, red blood cells have antigens. Any human tissue also uh, have their antigens. Bacteria and their toxins and viruses are also antigenic for our organism. So any foreign substance, any foreign substance is antigenic for human organism. What is chemical structure of antigen? Antigens can be protein or polysaccharides, and they are most antigenic. They cause a powerful immune response. Lipids and nucleic acids are less antigenic. They have a, a mild immune response. Uh, any antigen, any antigen consists of two parts. It is, uh, the first one is antigenic determinant. It is a part of antigen that reacts with antibody. It is a small part of antigen. It's just uh, two or three percent of the antigen surface. And the larger part of antigen is a carrier molecule. Carrier molecule is the larger part of antigen. Once more, antigen it is a foreign substance for human organisms that cause immune response. These are bacteria, viruses. Uh, it can be uh, red blood cells of another organism. Uh, it can be a tissue of another organism in transplantation, organ of another human organism. Uh, it can be um, uh, injected serum, for example. So bacteria, viruses, and human organisms have their own antigens. What about antigens of bacteria? This is bacterial cell. In this diagram, you can see bacterial cell. If bacteria have a cell wall, cell wall, red color, it is uh, showed uh, by red color. It has O antigen, O antigen. It is lipopolysaccharide of cell wall, O antigen. It is thermostable, it is not killed by high temperature. Then, if bacteria has a capsule, uh, it is called K antigen. K antigen is a um, polysaccharide substance. Capsule is made from polysaccharide in most bacteria. Uh, it is a thermolabel, sometimes, sometimes thermostable. K antigen. And this is H antigen that is present in bacteria, in motile bacteria. It is a flagellar antigen. It is thermolabile because it is, it is a protein. It is a protein. So uh, such bacteria, such bacteria cause production, cause production of three types of antibodies. Antibodies against O antigen, again, antibodies against K antigen, antibodies against H antigen. Viruses. Uh, in this diagram you can see enveloped, enveloped viruses. Enveloped viruses have such antigens like H, 
it is hemagglutinin and neraminidase antigen. RNA or DNA, you remember that viruses have just one type of nucleic acid, RNA or DNA antigen. Then capsid antigen, that is protein, and supercapsid antigen, that is glycolipid. Uh, Every of these substances, every of these substances is antigenic, is foreign for human organism and cause immune response. When antigen enters the human organism, when any microorganism or another cell, another foreign cell uh, enters the human organism, it causes immune response and production, production of antibodies, production of antibodies. What are antibodies? Antibodies, uh, it is also called immunoglobulins. These are globulin proteins that react specifically with the antigen that stimulate their production. Once more, antibodies are proteins that react specifically with antigen that stimulate their production. It means that every antigen cause production or stimulate production specific antibodies. If um, uh, there is a uh, coronavirus in human organism, it causes production of specific antibodies for this virus. These antibodies can bind just with coronavirus. Uh, if in this patient uh, there is a, another infection at this time, at that time, for example, um, maybe pneumonia caused by Staphylococcus aureus. There are antibodies that, are, uh, that react just with Staphylococcus. Antibodies can react just with such antigen that stimulate its production. They are very, very specific to each other. There is a very high level of um, specific of this property, they are specific. What about structure of antibodies? Antibody, this one, antibody, uh, antibody molecule has a Y shape and consists of four polypeptide chains. One, two, three, and four. There are two H chains, H chains uh, are called H because they are heavy chains. Heavy, they are long. One, the first one, and the second one, H chain. And two, L chains. L means light chains. They are shorter. This one and this one. And these chains are linked by disulfine bonds. Here. For example, then here. Uh, totally, um, molecule of antibody, antibody molecule, consists of two parts. Uh, the variable regions, FAB fragment, FAB, this part is responsible for antigen binding, antigen binding. Antibody binds to antigen with antigen binding sites here. These are antigen binding sites. And FC, fragment FC, that is a constant, is responsible for different biological functions. For example, binding to uh, human cells receptors uh, for placental transfer. Such immune globulin can be transferred through placenta. There are some immune globulin classes. There are some immune globulin classes. IgA, IgG, IgM, IgD, and IgE. And we will talk about them in immunology. Now you um, should just know these classes. What are these classes? Uh, maybe you know, for example, that IgG and IgM are indicators of infections, 
IgM is indicator of acute infection that is present now. IgG is indicator of um, infection that was in past or indicator of vaccination. That's why, for example, if we detect um, coronavirus in patient, if patient has coronavirus now, we can detect IgM. If uh, this patient uh, had infection in the past or uh, this patient was vaccinated, we can detect IgG. Why do we talk about uh, antigens and antibodies? And uh, why do we study it now, not in immunology? Uh, before, before, because uh, then, then, next lecture, I will tell you about uh, microorganisms and about diagnosis of infections caused by uh, these microorganisms. In diagnosis of infections, in diagnosis of infections, we use serological tests, serological tests. Serological arise uh, from serum, serum. Serum, it is a part of the blood that is lack of red blood cells and other blood cells. What are serological tests? They consist of antigens and antibodies reaction occurring in in vitro. So it is reaction of antigen and antibody that is used in laboratory. Serology uses antibodies, usually in serum of the patient, to identify and detect antigens. Or conversely, uses known antigens to detect antibodies. So serological tests are used to detect, to identify microorganisms. In the first lecture, we have studied uh, microbiological methods. Microbiological methods. These are microscopic, bacteriological, and serological methods. It is detection of antibodies in serum of the patient. So if uh, we have unknown antibody, uh, for example, we can collect patient serum, serum from the sick human, and there are antibodies there, we can detect what are these antibodies, which pathogen causes, caused production of these antibodies. If we have unknown antibodies, we should take known antigen. For example, pure culture of known bacterial species at the laboratory. If they react, if they react with each other, uh, it means positive result. If we know what is this antigen, name of this antigen, for example, if we know that it is Staphylococcus aureus and it reacts with antibodies in serum, it means that these antibodies are against Staphylococcus and this patient uh, has disease caused by Staphylococcus. Another variant, uh, when we have known antibodies. Known antibodies, it is a diagnostic commercial serum. They are produced by pharmaceutical companies, pharmaceutical um, factories. And uh, we should, uh, we can uh, make unknown antigen. It is uh, isolated bacteria from patient. If they react with each other, we know what is what are these uh, antibodies against which pathogen, we can say, or what is the name of pathogen that caused infection. Which reactions, uh, what, is a, a what is application of serological tests? We can use serological tests for determination of blood groups before transfusion, detection of bacteria for identification of bacteria, detection of antibodies in patient serum and for determination of some immune deficiency diseases in patients because in uh, some diseases uh, immune system of human organism uh, b cells produce antibodies antibodies against uh, our own human cells we can detect these antibodies and determine what is immune deficiency disease is present in human body so we have said that if we mix antigen and antibody, they can react if they are specific. If they are specific, if uh, antibody, if the antibody is caused by action of this antigen. Which reactions? Which reactions are used uh, in the laboratories 
for diagnosis. There are a lot of reactions. Uh, today I uh, want to explain just two types of these reactions. In immunology, we will talk about it more. The first one is the agglutination test. Agglutination test. Agglutination test involves reaction between particulate antigens, that is called agglutinogen, and antibody, that is called agglutinin. They bond and form visible aggregates if they are specific to each other. Look here. Bacterium is antigen. This is antibody. This antibody is caused by this antigen. Antibody production is caused by this antigen. So they are specific. Antibody binds to antigen. And they form complexes that is called agglutinate. Agglutinate. How is it visible? Uh, we do this test on the slide. On the slide, we mix um, serum of the patient, and we uh, we mix serum of the patient with bacteria. If we see flakes, flakes like here, like in the left diagram, it is positive result. Flakes because bacteria are combined with each other with. Uh, via antibodies. We can see flakes. Flakes means uh, it is, uh, aggregates large amount of bacteria. If we see turbidity, like in the right picture, it is negative result. It means that bacteria are not combined, are not bond with uh, antibodies. Uh, precipitation test is the next one. Precipitation test involves the reaction of soluble antigens, proteins, toxins. The main difference between agglutination and precipitation test in the uh, uh, origin of antigen. Let's come back. Agglutination test uses particulate antigens. Particulate means these are wall bacterial cell. Wall bacterial cell. In precipitation, we use soluble. It is soluble substance, protein, for example. Antigen uh, in precipitation test is called precipitinogen. Antibody is called precipitin. And complex of antigen and antibody is called precipitate. We uh, should mix antibodies, for example, serum with antibodies, and then antigen, for example, bacterial toxin in the tube. If they are specific to each other, they form complex, antigen-antibody complex. And uh, this complex is visible as a white line. Here, look here, a white line or a white ring, ring of precipitate or precipitate band. So it means a positive result, positive result. Now, uh, that's all uh, from this <clears throat> uh, lecture. That's all from this uh, lecture. Once more, I'm repeating. For next class, you should prepare both lectures number five and number six, both about microflora and about immunity. Uh, then, uh, next class, you will have practical class. And after that, after that, you will have colloquium. Colloquium means uh, will include lectures from the first one up to the sixth. You may start to prepare these lectures uh, for colloquium. Your teacher at practice class will remind you about it. Don't forget to prepare your practical copy books for uh, to finish your practical copy books. Now that's all. That's all. Uh, we can finish our classes. I can see who is present today. Mm -hmm. Very good. I can see. Thanks for your attention. Goodbye. Take care of you.